Today we're going to take a look at another method for finding volume. This is called the shell method. And just to kind of give you a picture point of view, um, the idea is that when we worked with disks and washer methods, we saw that these regions were perpendicular to the x-axis. Do you remember drawing those in your homework? They were perpendicular. And when we spun the region around whatever axis or line we were referring to, we ended up getting a disk or a washer. In the shell method, our region ends up being parallel to our axis of revolution. So we draw our rectangle differently. That's important. That's where these drawings are going to come into play. If you draw your rectangle incorrectly, you're integrating with respect to the wrong variable, right? Yeah. Parallel to our axis of revolution. And when we spin, instead of creating a disk or a washer, we're actually going to create a cylinder. Right? So I've got three videos. Do you guys have to move your popcorn with you today? No? Okay, that's what my, husband, my son would be asking for is where's the popcorn? We're going to do three videos to kind of give you a sense of what this looks like in three dimensions, okay? All right. All right, so um, the videos we're watching are by a guy named Derek Owens, and he does a really good job of visualizing what's going on. I don't expect you to draw three-dimensionally on your drawings, but I do expect you to draw those representative regions that we've been doing back in the last section as well. So to start with, we are going to take a look at this idea of volume. So when he was describing the volume, he did the volume of a cylinder, and he was describing it with what formula do you remember? 2 pi times r, the radius. times, first he did the height, uh -huh, times the height, and then he did it times dx or dy or dr, depending on which um, particular example he was describing, and it was the thickness he was using there, wasn't it? And the reason that that thickness became dx or dr, or whatever variable we were working with, was because that thickness was actually approaching zero. And so when we do that, we have the shell method, and there's two formulas your book uses for the shell method, depending on the axis of revolution. So it does matter if we're dealing with horizontal or vertical. Now, the formulas are very similar, <laughs> as you will see. Um, so we're going to pull that 2 pi out, just like you saw him do on that last one. It's the, um, the constant, so we can pull that out. We're going to integrate this. I'm going to write this as c to try that again, c to d. And we're going to have the radius. So the radius will be when the horizontal axis of revolution is used, we will actually have a radius in terms of y. We will have a height in terms of y. So these are both functions of y when we have a horizontal axis of revolution, which you didn't see him do one of those, by the way. You saw him do the other one. Okay, so you did everything in terms of x. And then our thickness is dy. So what do you think is going to change when we do the volume for a vertical axis of revolution? We're going to do it in terms of x. So much of this formula remains the same. Um, we are going to write this with a and b as our limits of integration um, because we don't want to think that the c and the d are actually the same values because they're not. Um, and so we have a different set of values that will be in terms of x. But then our radius will be in terms of x, our height will be in terms of x, and our thickness will be in terms of x. So like we said, r of x, r of y is the radius of the shell, and h of x or h of y is the height of the shell. All right, so you guys ready to actually do one? We visualized quite a bit already today. Okay, so let's take a look at one that we can do. We're going to use the shell method to set up and evaluate an integral to find the volume of a solid generated by revolving, and I'm sorry it's all crammed in there, but it looks much better on your notes, y equals 4x minus x squared x equals 0 and y equals 4, and we're going to rotate this around the y-axis. All right, so to start with, and as you start on any of these, you're going to start with a picture, okay? So you're always going to be drawing me some kind of a picture of the region that this is describing, in as much as anything else for your own benefit, so that you can picture where the radius and where the height are in that, in that example, okay? So if you want to, um, we're going to grab, you can grab out your calculator and um, you can actually graph this one. This actually happens to be one that you saw in your homework last night. So you may remember if you don't, that's fine too. We want to graph a 4x minus x squared. So what does that equation look like when you graph it? 
It's going to be a parabola. How's it going to open, Jordan? Can you tell? Down. It's going to open downward. And um, if you're graphing it already, you probably see something like this. Does that look pretty close? Yeah? Oh. Well. All right, so here is our shape. Um, we're supposed to go from x equals 0. What is x equals 0? What is it otherwise known as? The y-axis. So this is x equals 0 right here. So here is x equals 0. We're supposed to go out to y equal 4. What does y equal 4 look like? Caesar's making a horizontal line. It's a horizontal line, right? And it happens to be a horizontal line right here at the peak of this, if you were to graph this, OK? So here is y equals 4. So what part of this is actually creating my solid? Can you see it? No, you can't. All right, just a second. All right, so we have this object. My horizontal line doesn't look very horizontal. Um, but can you see the trapped area? Can you see the part that we're actually going to shade in? Yeah, we've got this piece over here. Not Again, not drawn especially well, but it's trapped over here. Right? This is the piece that we're talking about rotating. And we're rotating around which axis? The y-axis. So we're going to draw that same sort of a circular shape that we did last time. And we're going to draw a representative rectangle. So as I draw my representative rectangle, that's different now. What's different? Parallel. It's parallel. And I had a student one time tell me that she remembered it because parallel and shell rhyme. So there you go, shell parallel. Right? So that's how she remembered which one was parallel, was that it's a shell method she uses, a parallel. So this has to be parallel to the y-axis, which means my representative rectangle looks something like that yellow piece right there. Okay? I'm not going to draw three dimensions for you, okay? but you're welcome to draw them if it helps you to visualize it. There's two things that we need. We need to know the radius, that is, we need to know how far the yellow line is from the axis of revolution. So from my picture point of view, this right here is my radius. And we need to know the height. That is, we need to know how tall this piece of yellow is. And those are the only two pieces of information we really need to know. Well, I take it back. We need to know our limits of integration as well. We need to know in terms of x or y, how far, where we start and where we end. We need to know those, those pieces as well. So we're taking a look, and we have this wonderful volume equation. And first, let's figure out which one do we need. Do we need the volume for a horizontal axis of revolution or a vertical axis of revolution? Vertical. It's vertical. So I'm going to put everything in terms of x. All right, so the volume formula that I'm going to be using has a 2 pi. I have an integral, and I know I'm going to have a dx at the end. Right? In between here, I've got some letters. Your book uses a and b here. I've got a radius in terms of x and then a height in terms of x. All right, so let's take a look over here in our picture at the radius at the height and figure out what those are. What is my radius? What is the distance from that vertical axis of revolution out to my curve? Not quite. So perhaps a point would help. This point right here is what we're trying to find. This is the point on my curve that will help me to figure out what my height and my, my radius are. What do you have? Is it x? It is x. The radius is simply x. x is the distance from my x-axis, or excuse me, my y-axis, out to my curve. What you're giving me, Jordan, is my distance from my y value, which is going to come into play for my height, though. So we are going to need that. So my radius for this particular problem is simply x. Now, my height isn't exactly y, though. What would y be on this picture? Where would it be located? There's the point y. What is it representing? Right. It's going from my x-axis up to this point, which is not the value I want. I want this piece at the top, the yellow part. So this right here is y. And the yellow part above is what I'm looking for. So how can I use that or describe that? And we'll do it right now in terms of y. It'd be 4 minus y, exactly. So this height is actually 4 minus y. Sorry, that's written on top of it, but that's 4 minus y. But I don't want this in terms of y. I need it in terms of x. 
So if we're thinking about this, I've actually got, um, he, he described this um, when he was working as dv, as 2 pi. The radius is x, and then my height is 4 minus y. And again, I want this in terms of x. So how do I change this so that it doesn't say 4 minus y? Yeah, I replace y with what y is equal to, and that was given to me up here in the original problem, right? y is 4x minus x squared. So my volume can be rewritten or can be written as the 2 pi at the front. I still haven't done limits of integration. I promise I won't forget. Um, my radius is x. My height is 4 minus what y equals, which is 4x minus x squared. There's a dx at the end. I'm sorry, I'm out of space, but imagine it's there. I still need limits of integration. I need to know the lower value for x and the upper value for x. So what is my lower value for x? What is the minimum radius or the minimum x value on this particular thing? It is 0, yes. How about my upper value, my upper limit? We haven't found it yet. Can you visually see where it would be? Well, my smallest radius is down here at the bottom, right? My largest radius is up here at the top to wherever I stop right there. It's 2 on this one, yeah. And if you weren't sure, you could take your calculator to take a picture or to look at the picture um, a little bit more in depth. The other thing that you could do is you could actually set the original equation that you, were ha that you had. And in some cases, you have to do it this way. On this one, it's not too bad. You want it to be equal to 4. The reason I say this one's not too bad is because you can probably do a little bit of guess and check pretty quick and say, hmm, I think it might be 2, and if you put the number 2 in, it'll work, right? 2 actually make 4 times 2 is 8 minus four, 2 squared, which is 4, so we actually get 4. So this actually is x equal to 2. So my limit of integration on the top actually is 2 on this one. All of that was using all those visual skills that we've been working on, right? That wasn't calculus. Although the visualization for it that is definitely challenging, that's not the calculus part of what we're going to do. The calculus part is the integration. And before I actually do the integration, Erica, you and I were working this morning. What would we like to do before we do that integration? Can somebody help her out? Simplify what's there, right? Because if we simplify what's there, we often have to take fewer integrals. I mean, that's kind of the deal, is that it makes our lives easier. All right, so let me move this to the next slide, and we will take a look at simplifying that. Okay, and that's a dx at the end now. All right, so um, I heard some people say words like distribute, and that would be a good thing to do. So let's start doing that in order to simplify. So I'm going to have an x over here. I have 4 minus 4x plus x squared, right? And then if I were to leave it like this, I would have the same kind of overarching problem that he did with his x sine x example, right? I have a product, and you do not have a product rule for integration. There's a way to handle that. You haven't learned, but we aren't there yet. But you do have a way with algebra to simplify this. You can distribute, right? So we're going to distribute. And I have 4x minus 4x squared plus 4x cubed. Is it, just oh, it is x cubed. You're right. Got it. Overexcited with my x's, didn't I? x cubed. Thank you. All right, so far so good. So now we're going to integrate because now we're at a point where we've got it all cleaned up on the inside. And my integration is actually pretty nice because this is a polynomial, right? All right, so what's the antiderivative of 4x? 2x squared. How about 4x squared? What's that one? All right, 4x cubed over 3. And then the x cubed x to the fourth over 4. And we're going to evaluate all of that at 2 and then evaluate that at 0. 
And I'm going to save the two pi till the very, very end. I'm not going to deal with it at all because there's just it's not helpful in the slightest. I guess it might simplify one of those denominators a little bit, but it won't even make it go away in this one. So we're going to save that two pi until the very end. And we're going to evaluate. So we're going to evaluate this with the number two in here. And then we're going to evaluate it with the number zero in here. What happens when we evaluate with zero? Yay! That's the wonderful thing about polynomials. And perhaps why you guys don't like the sign and the trig functions as well, right? <laughs> they, they don't always become zero when you plug zeros in. Some of them do, but not all of them. All right, so what is the first piece? What is 2 times 2 squared? Okay. Yep, that one's 8. How about 4 times 2 cubed over 3? What is it over 3? 32. 32. Good, yep. And then 2 to the 4th over 4? That one's just 4. All right, so grab your calculator or do this real quick in your head. Either one would be acceptable, although you should be able to do it. What do you get when you combine 8, negative 32 over 3, and positive 4? You do get 4 over 3. This is 4 thirds. Now I'm ready to multiply that 4 thirds times the 2 pi to give me what? 8 pi over 3. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay. Same directions as the last one. Use a shell method to set up and evaluate the integral that gives the volume of the solid generated. I've got different uh, function this time. I've got y equals x cubed. Is that what that says? Yeah. x equals 0 and y equals 8. And this time we're rotating around the x-axis. So wh what is my first step? What do I need to do in order to actually work with this problem? I need to draw a picture. The picture is going to give me so much information without it. I'm sort of guessing a little bit. So that, that picture is super helpful. So my picture is supposed to be going from x equals 0 to y equals 8. And I've got a picture of x cubed. Do you remember what x cubed looks like? Yeah, it's those cubic, one of those cubic curves. It has a shape that looks something like this. Sorry, my pen made it look a little bit more straight on the end than I intended. But this is the more or less the shape. Which axis? X-axis. So I'm rotating this down here. Um, I have some uh, limits of integration, or, well, some other functions that are bounding my curve. One of them is x equals 0, which is the y-axis, right? So it's this one. The other one is y equals 8, which is a horizontal line up here, right, at 8. So my bounded region is right in here. I actually have a what kind of axis of revolution this time? Horizontal. It is horizontal. So how will I draw my representative rectangle? Yeah, to the side, like horizontal, right, Janet? Yeah, I will draw it horizontal. So my axis of revolution being horizontal means that my representative rectangle is horizontal. This is the first one of these that we've done. We haven't done, and we didn't see him do one that was actually done in horizontal. What, what does that mean if I'm doing it horizontal? I've got to do it in terms of y. And if you weren't sure, your picture tells you, right? Do you see the thickness? The thickness right here is delta y. That is in terms of y, right? The thickness of my rectangle is in terms of y. Just like when we were looking at section 7-1, right? The thickness is in terms of how thick that rectangle is where you're working. So this will be in terms of y, which means the volume formula that I'm going to be using is in terms of y. So your book uses it like this. All right, so in terms of the picture, let's go back to the picture and figure out for my picture what in the world are the radius and the height. Where is the radius in this picture?
Right. It goes from that representative rectangle to the axis of revolution, which is the x-axis. So it looks like it's a vertical value. This is my radius. I'm going to use a different color because I don't like the fact that was black. There we go. Gives a little bit more dimension. Here is my radius. Let me just use R for now. Okay, so notice my radius is actually not the width of the piece that I'm, that I'm messing with, right? It's the distance that the point is, we'll use this point right here, from the axis of revolution. So what is that distance in this picture? That's y. That is the value y. So that's kind of nice, because that radius is already in terms of y. I, I don't want to write equals x cubed or whatever, because I don't want this in terms of x. I want it in terms of y. All right, how about height? Where is the height in this picture? Okay, so the height in the picture, though, I mean, like you guys are telling me already what the values are. What is the picture telling you where the height is? It's horizontal, and it's the horizontal length of the yellow piece, right? Yeah, so this right here is my height, because what you want to do is you want the height of the rectangle. Okay, so there's my height, and in this picture, what is the height? It's x, right? It's the distance from the left to the right, okay, the distance of, of that, and the left-hand side is x equals 0, and the right-hand side is x equals whatever it is in the formula I'm working with. So this height is actually x. The height being x is actually unhelpful in this case because I want my height in terms of y. And all of a sudden, I get something that's not quite so friendly to work with as those wonderful polynomials from before. I have the cube root of y. That's a terrible 3 for that cube root. Why is it the cube root of y? Because y is x cubed. And if I were to take that equation and solve it for x, I would find that x is the cube root of y. Those are the pieces of information. Oh, and I need the C and the D. I need my limits of integration with respect to y. What is my minimum y value? It's 0. It's down here. And the maximum y value? It's 8, because it's the top of that blue shaded in region, 8. All right, so over here, I actually can set this up now. My volume is 2 pi times my integral from 0 to 8. of my radius, which was y, times my height, which is the cube root of y, times dy. There are fewer pieces to this than the last one we did, but the piece that we were working with still looks like a product, doesn't it? And you do not have a product rule. So what in the world could you do to simplify that? That would be a grand idea. I like that one. So I can change that cube root of y as y to the one third. So Parker, what was your idea to do with that next? Uh, well, you have y to the one times y to the one third. So can't you just add those? Yes. So if one of our properties of exponents, which we reviewed in the last chapter as well, is that when we have um, the same base, we can add the exponents. This is understood to be y to the one, and the other one's y to the one third. So one plus one third is what? four-thirds. Okay, let's try that again. Now we're ready to integrate, yeah? What is the integral of y to the 4 thirds? 
Okay, so it's y to the 7 thirds, and then we would divide by 7 thirds or multiply by 3 over 7. I have this 2 pi in front still, and I'm going to evaluate that at 8 and 0. So far so good? Okay, so let's do that evaluation. Um, in fact, it might be helpful for us to do one thing before that. Let me think. Why did a 7 thirds, what does that mean? cube root of y, and I'm going to put to the 7th on the outside of it, not because it couldn't be written the other way, but simply because it'll be easier for us to cube root the number first and then do the power of 7 instead of the other direction. So that will just remind us we can choose either direction of it. This is the one that will be most helpful in this case. All right, so when I evaluate this at 8, I have the cube root of 8, which I will then raise to the 7th power. And then what happens when I cube root my 0 and whatnot? You have 3 over 7. Oh, I wrote 3 over 8, didn't I? I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, what happens when I cube root my 0? I get 0, so the second piece is still going to be 0 on this one. All right, so let's actually simplify that now. What is the cube root of 8? 2. What is 2 to the 7th? That is 128. I don't want to do 8 to the power of 7 and then cube root it. That doesn't sound like fun to me at all. All right, but we can do the other right way, which actually works nicely. Um, now we need to know what in the world is 128 times 3 and or divided by 7 if that's possible. Okay, and then did you already multiply by the 2 on the outside or not? Okay, so you've got the full answer, right, Taylor? 7, 68 pi over 7. Any questions on that one?